I V M. Hello and welcome to the Wire Talks. I'm Siddharth Bhatia. In the early 1960s, a young American researcher came to India to learn Bengali and Sanskrit. During the year, she also wrote regular letters to her parents, describing her life in this strange, faraway land. That young researcher, Wendy Doniger, grew up to become one of the leading academics in the humanities, known for her work on India and its traditions. She was widely respected in the academic community, but some years ago, recently, in fact, she came to a wider public consciousness because many groups criticized her for a book on the Hindus, a much praised book on the Hindus, I may add. The letters, meanwhile, lay forgotten till she found them and are now collected in a new book titled An American Girl in India. It's a documentation not only of her impressions of India at the time, but also of an India which was still a very young country, barely 15 years after independence. The book is a breezy read full of anecdotes of a writer who approaches the country with a very open mind. And some of the things she writes about do require an open mind. Wendy Doniger, welcome to the Wire Talks. Thank you for your interest. You begin the book by saying you came to India in 63, 1963 to study Indian languages. How did that come about and were other young researchers from America too traveling to India at the time? Well, there was an organization, the American Institute of Indian Studies, which funded my trip, which funded other people too. So I met other Americans who had been sent to India with the same background, but most of them weren't Sanskritists. They were mostly anthropologists and people who were doing work that required um, research in what was happening in India. I was interested in the ancient past, so that it was a particular privilege for me not only to read the texts with pundits, but to see India. So I was reading these stories about mountains and rivers and beautiful women in the countryside and cows, and I got a chance to see the mountains and the rivers and the beautiful women in the countryside and the cows. So for me, I was watching mythology, especially in the countryside, not so much in the city of Calcutta, but in the countryside around Shantini Ketan, I could very well imagine the scenes that I had been reading in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So it was a chance to make real uh, the text that I had already been studying for several years by that time. So it was a wonderful privilege. I also did indeed study the language, but one could study the language elsewhere. You couldn't get to see the the women and the cows um, in the countryside without going there. So it was an experience of of the land and people of India more than the opportunity to work with pundits that brought me there and that uh, that I found most important. But it must have been quite a decision to study Indian languages. You are sitting in America in a university, and then suddenly you decide to study an Indian language, two Indian languages, as a matter of fact, and to actually come to the country that was so distant physically as well as culturally. How did uh, that, I mean, what went on in your head to make that decision? It was long before college. It was when I was actually quite young maybe 10 or 11 years old, that my mother gave me a copy of E.M. Foster's A Passage to India. And then I read Rumor Garden's stories, uh, um, Multiki and other stories about India. Um, so I was interested in India when I was quite young. And then in high school, I studied Latin and Greek, and my Greek teacher told me there was such a thing as Sanskrit. So I became more and more interested in ancient India. And it was precisely because it was far away that it appealed to me. I, I came from a very active political background. My mother was very serious communist. There was always protests and things. And I got involved in all that. And after a while, I thought I wanted to get as far off, away from it as possible. I wanted to go someplace long ago and far away. So when I was just 17 and I chose a college, I chose Radcliffe, which was the only place that women could study at Harvard at the time, and the only place where a freshman in college could study Sanskrit. I chose my college precisely in order to study Sanskrit. 
um, and became more and more interested in it. And then after I graduated, I got a grant to go to India. So this was the fulfillment of a, of a long standing interest in the country. And, um, I, I would say a kind of affinity that I felt for India, for instance. I always liked to wear red and purple and orange. And at that time, all the women were wearing basic black or tasteful gray. And uh, so I was out of place. And I, I liked Indian paintings where there were lots and lots and lots of things going on, animals and people. And, and, and I liked it better than the Mona Lisa, just one woman sitting there. I couldn't really see the point of that. And I liked Indian music. Um, uh, where instead of having the strict scale, one, two, three, four, five, you, you slid up and down the scale. Um, so I loved Indian food. I loved eating with my fingers. I thought it was so great. I hated knives and forks. So the whole culture really seemed to appeal to me, and I wanted to see the real thing. So it was not a sudden whim. It was the fulfillment of, of years of interest. The the problem, the shock, the challenge was whether the India that I had imagined and read about in ancient Sanskrit texts was anything like what I was going to find when I got off the plane in Calcutta. And that's really what the book is mostly about. It's about my adjustment to the difference between the India of my dreams and the India that I actually found myself in. And that was the real challenge for a young girl. I'd never been away from home. I was spoiled. I'd never seen poor people in America. There were lots of poor people in America, but it wasn't part of my world. So there was a lot to adjust to in India, the real world in general, as well as India in particular. So it was a very important growth experience for me. When I started reading the letters, there was a lot that embarrassed me because I was pretty stupid. I was certainly naive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I made a lot of mistakes. And when I was planning to do the book, my wonderful publisher, Ravi Singh, I said, you know, we've got to cut this. I'll, I can't I can't publish this. I, I'll never live it down. We've got to cut this. And he said, no, no, no. He said, leave it in, but explain it. Apologize for it. Explain how you've changed since then. And so it was his idea, really, to make the book kind of a conversation between the 81-year-old me looking back at this rather foolish, wildly enthusiastic, but rather foolish young girl sort of flailing about in India. So that was that was the fun of the book for me, really. Yeah, I think at one place you actually say in one section, rapid and stupid, uh, <laughs> with your philosophical, <laughs> you know, musings. But uh, before I come to that, that was around the time when the beats were about to come or had come, right? Yeah, had come. Um, we didn't have the Hare Krishnas yet. It was before that that part of India got to got to America. Um, so I was a Bohemian. We went to Greenwich Village and um, a lot of jazz, and we all wore black. And um, there were certain affectations um, in, in the group in, in which I traveled. Um, but the India that we knew, we knew Ravi Shankar's music. Um, not much. I didn't know much else about Indian music at the time. I just heard that when I went to India, I met Ali Akbar Khan, and yes. that became my my really important introduction to Indian Indian music. But there was Indian painting. There were translations. Though I read a translation of the Upanishads in the Penguin edition. I now know it's a terrible translation, but at the time I thought it was absolutely wonderful. So India was available. Um, Heinrich Simmer had written a book about India, an introduction. Um, Basham wrote a book, The Wonder That Was India. There And there were the novels. There was the, the Passage to India, as I read. There was Kipling's Kim. You know, there were all sorts of places you could read about India. Um, and then, of course, I read about ancient India in the Sanskrit texts. Nonetheless, your parents must have been a bit shocked, at least worried about your security, were they? Yeah, they were indeed. Um, I really had never left home before. Um, one of the things that I did in the letters was I lied to them. I lied to them all the time. I, I didn't tell them the kind of trouble I was getting into. Um, I didn't tell them how ill I was. I became I actually had to leave India early because I became so ill. I didn't tell them about sleeping at night 
on the floor of the third class ladies' waiting room in the railway stations, and with the chokidar watching over us, all the other women, Indian women, and me, you rolled up your passport and your money in a little sari and put it under your head for a pillow, and that was your security. So they weren't as worried as they might have been if they had, uh, if I had told them all the things that happened to me. So I, I tried to keep them calm. Well, there is a letter in which you talk about uh, fainting due after an animal sacrifice, I think. So Yes. Well, that, that was part of the lie. So, yes. So I went to see an animal sacrifice. It was a great privilege in a private home, the sacrifice of a goat. Early in the morning, dawn, you know, all these things happened at dawn on an empty stomach on a hot day. And um, I described in my letter how they grabbed the goat's horns with one hand and another guy grabbed his haunches with another and they stretched him out and the third guy took a curved sword and whacked down and the head sprang away from the body. And then I said, then I decided I needed some fresh air. That's what I put into the letter. What had happened was I passed out cold on the ground, hit my head on the ground as I fell. My friends had to carry me outside and fan me and give me drinks of water. They missed the rest of the ceremony. Of course, I missed the rest of the ceremony. And that, I think, was the moment when I decided not to be an anthropologist and just to stick to the translation of Sanskrit texts. But I did not tell my parents I had passed out on the floor. So they... uh, So they didn't worry. I also minimized the violence that I was seeing in South Calcutta toward Muslims as the early skirmishes of what was going to be the Indo-Pak War of 1965 um, were happening. I did see some people killed. I was caught in a crowd once I felt I couldn't get out of. I was rescued from. So I, I played that down, too. I said, you know, don't read everything you read in the papers. Things are really fine here. Things are fine. No, but was there, uh, because you don't talk about it, was there a personal issue of safety? Uh, Was there any kind of time when you felt personally threatened? I never felt personal. I never thought I was going to be mugged or raped or attacked. I traveled alone. Um, I traveled in, in railways. People were kind to me. I went into a railway and some elderly gentleman sat down and talked to me. And people, people were very kind to me. I felt protected. Um, sometimes the railway master took me to his house for lunch with his family and so forth. So I, I never felt personally insecure, even though I was alone and I was a young woman. The one time I felt in danger was when I was trying to reassure my parents that there was no trouble in Calcutta about uh, the uh, trouble with the Indo-Pak War. So I went to mail a telegram to them saying, I'm really fine, don't worry about things. And when I tried to leave the post office, there was a big crowd of very angry people with lattes. And um, they were they were not after me, but they were after someone. And I was caught up in the crowd. And then I was frightened. But um, uh, Professor Dimmick, at whose house I was living, and his driver came in the Jeep and s- scooped me up and put me in the Jeep and drove me away. That was the only time I felt physical danger, and it wasn't directed at me. I was just in a crowd, a, a very scary crowd. But no, I was amazingly how naive I was and how I got away with it. I, I traveled alone, and people were kind to me, and I assumed that they would be, and they were. Despite you being an obvious foreigner uh, at a time when not many foreigners were seen Absolutely. on Indian streets, when, when I first came to India, I wore my European clothes. I wore dresses, or short skirts. And then men stared at my legs because they weren't used to seeing women's legs at that time. So I started wearing saris. And they're more comfortable. And the Dolby didn't destroy them as quickly as he destroyed American dresses. And um, it was fun. It was dressing up in a way. And I had friends who taught me how to do the pleats back and forth, pleats, 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 and so forth. And then I didn't get stared at. You couldn't see my legs. I, I don't think I passed for an Indian woman, but I wasn't so obviously a foreigner. And my body was not so obviously available for the male gaze. The sorry covers you pretty well. And so that, that took care of that. I figured that out within a week or two. And then I didn't worry about, um, about men and, I didn't worry about being robbed. I wasn't usually all by myself. In the countryside, in Santi de Caton, I was often all by myself. But in cities, there were people. I was with friends. And I, and I, on the trains, I, I, I made friends. People, 
recited poetry and they sang songs for me and they read me. They, it was wonderful, the people I met in trains. I, I love the Indian trains. Once I had to crawl in through the window. It was so crowded you couldn't get through the door. And somebody boosted me up and I, I went through the window into the train. That was how, that's how I got on. I thought that was wonderful. But, but you know, you talk about your high faluting philosophical posturings and biased political generation generalizations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you mentioned that reading them makes you cringe now. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, for the rapidity, the stupidity of the whole uh, thing. But how were you to know what you were seeing was any different? I mean, uh, you hadn't yet started your career. Yeah. So uh, what were the political generalizations that you thought about or you? I was with Bengalis uh, and I was my best friend was a Punjabi. And um they were very anti-Nehru. They were very angry. Um, they had both been in places which had suffered greatly during partition. They blamed the decisions um, to do partition at all or the way they did it on Nehru and sometimes on Gandhi and the Indian government. Um, they were very left-wing. The Bengalis were communists, really. Um, and so I would write home to my parents, everybody hates Nehru. Everybody in India hates Nehru. Whereas um, it's just a, a couple of hot-headed Bengalis uh, hated Nehru and so forth. So I, I didn't understand that. There were famines. Uh, there were demonstrations. There were strikes. Uh, there were demonstrations about the failure to distribute the rice. Then it wasn't actually that there wasn't. I was told the problem was not that there wasn't enough rice, but that it was not being distributed. People were starving. So I knew people who were political activists who were against the present government. And I thought that what they said was right. And uh, later on, I discovered that there were other important, wise opinions about what was happening in India at that time, uh, which I knew nothing about. I just, I believe what these, what my friends told me, and my friends were a very particular sort of Indian people. So that's what I now find stupid. <laughs> that's part of what I find stupid. That's one of the things I now find stupid. But you met some interesting and very, very uh, wonderful people, your hosts, oh. your, you know, a whole lot of people uh, just passing yeah. uh, on trains. But wonderful. Ali Akbar Khan, now that, I think that part is so, so warm. He takes to you, he offers you teaching, he offers to teach you. I think you did learn a little bit. Uh, I learned a lot. Yep, he, he, he helped me buy a sarod. I had Sarod lessons. I went to all of his concerts, both the ones that he gave himself and the ones that he gave with Ravi Shankar, and not just the public concert, but he played at a lot of weddings and people's homes, all night concerts in people's homes and before and after weddings. So I really heard him play a great deal. And I learned a lot about Indian music. He was playing with Ala Raka at that time, a wonder, wonderful um, uh, drum player, tambo player. So that was near the end of my time, and it was it was wonderful. It was the winter time, uh, lots of concerts, and it was just lucky that I met him and that uh, we took to each other. We became friends. We stayed friends. Later on, he moved to America. I was teaching for three years in Berkeley in the seventies, and he was. He founded a music school across the bridge from Berkeley in San Rafael, and I saw him a bit then too, and then finally I moved from Berkeley, and I didn't see him again, but, but he became a real friend, and I, and I liked him enormously. I didn't like Ravi Shankar so much. I thought Ravi Shankar was sort of, oh, I don't know, posturing, and he played the great man, and uh, uh, Ali Akbar was more just like a fellow and very casual. Ravi Shankar dressed up a lot, very fancy, and Ali Akbar just sort of wore a shirt. Whatever he happened to have on was what he performed in. So, so I, I liked him better. I also thought he was a greater musician, but I didn't really know what I was talking about. I just thought so. I still think so. I still think so, and I do know more about Indian music now. Um, but that was a lucky thing to meet him, and, to, and we just we liked each other, became friends right away. So uh, that was a, that was a wonderful thing. But I met other people who weren't so famous, who were also wonderful, 
taught me to dance and to sing. The women I met at Sandy Niketan taught me lots of Bengali songs, and we sang together, and I danced. I studied dancing at Sandy Niketan. So people taught me poems. They read their books to me. It was wonderful. I met many wonderful people that I... Then I met some other famous people. I met Jamini Roy, the painter. He lived in Bengal. And I, I, I bought several paintings from him, and I sat in his studio, and he talked to me. That was great proof. That's amazing. That was that part was simply amazing that you bought a painting from him. Yeah, for thirty dollars, I think I bought a Germany Roy painting. I still have it. <laughs> I absolutely still have it. So oh, the India you talk about at the time, in some ways, is long gone. I mean, the infrastructure problems, things have got better. Well, I won't say the poverty is gone, but certainly there's a bigger middle class of shortages. Yes. The shortages have more or less disappeared for at least most of the people. You've been coming to India regularly after that. What else has changed, let's say, in the terms of social attitudes? I think there is less friendliness to strangers. <laughs> what I noticed so much was that people said, oh, you're not Indian. Here, sit here. Let me talk to you. And it was, I guess it was not that usual to have, as you said, there, there weren't that many people. So to be a visitor to India is not to be welcomed in that same way. It's um, to be begged from and to be sold things to and so forth. So you're more an economic object of interest and less an object of cultural interest. I was an object of cultural interest. What do you believe in? Where do you come from? Why do you wear your hair that way? Um, the, the girls at Shanti Niketan, we talked about uh, how you were with, how you could go out with boys in America and do stuff and so forth. So I found the kind of personal interest and curiosity um, about me as a foreigner rather than hostility. And when I've been in India now, it, it's, first of all, it's overwhelming. It's so much, there's so much more. It's so crowded. It's so busy. It's so electronic. It's so noisy. In Shanti Niketan in particular, it was so rural. It was, it was so slow. Uh, you got around by bullock carts. I mean, can, you know, in Delhi, you don't get around. I, people like me don't get around in bullock carts anymore. So it's become industrialized. It's become busy. And because of television and so forth, the, the rest of the world is not so mysterious as it was to the villagers I knew in, in Bolpur in those days. People aren't so curious about how things are in America. They know. They see the sitcoms and so forth. So the whole idea of being culturally interesting, and culturally unique in some ways, how do they do this in your country? This is how we do it in our country. That exchange of songs, the how do you? What? How do people dance? And so I taught them how to rumba. And then they taught me a little bit of how to do money putty dancing and so forth. That idea that it was um, interesting to have someone from somewhere else to show yourself to, to show India to, and at the same time to learn from. We changed folk songs. I knew a lot of folk songs. The women I met at Shanti Niketan had knew other songs. I. So Rab Rabindra Sangeet and so forth. So that's just all impossible in India today because everything is so international, everything is so public, everything is so uh, available on television. The whole world that I, the world of intimacy and curiosity that I enjoyed so much is gone. No, but uh, in terms of social attitudes in general, not to foreigners, but uh, in general, yeah. do you find Indians. Yes, there are differences. There are certainly differences. I, um, both in Calcutta and in my travels and also in Shanti Niketan, I was disturbed by um, the way, uh, by caste, by the treatment of servants, by the treatment of low caste people, um, and um, on the way they were non-people. They were sort of didn't exist. On more recent trips to India, I find much less of that. I find that working people, even servants, um, they still do the jobs when someone has to do, but I found there was more respect and decency in the attitude uh, toward people of low caste in the cities when I was in Jaipur, and, and I, was, I never went back to Calcutta. I've been to Calcutta for 50 years, but in Delhi and in Bombay and in Jaipur, the cities I visited, I 
I thought there was a little more social decency about the place. It was less embarrassing to be in the presence of people who did not exist when I was there in the 60s. So I thought that was much better. So moving on, since then, you came to India several times. You wrote many books on India, uh, including one uh, called Eroticism in the Mythology of Shiva. These books that was the were, first one. Yes. Mm. These books were greatly appreciated in academic circles. And suddenly, <laughs> you were in the midst of a very public storm a few years ago because of your book on the Hindus. What changed? Okay. What changed was both the kind of books I wrote and the way that India treated books. So the first books that I wrote were indeed um, about, uh, you left out what was asceticism and eroticism. It was the erotic ascetic. Um, the first books that I wrote were about Sanskrit texts, mostly about the ancient world. They were about um, human topics, but they were not about it was not clear how they related to contemporary India. This is how the Sanskrit was. This is the Mahabharata. These are the medieval Puranas. So the Hindus was written for a different reason and a different way. Um, I had been given a, giving a talk in London with Will mm -hmm. Dalrymple. He was my chair. Will Dalrymple was my chair. I gave a talk at the School of Oriental and African Studies, and somebody threw an egg at him. It missed us. Uh, it went splat on the wall behind us. And um, Will wrote a piece for the Times mm. of London saying that this was the beginning of a kind of militant Hinduism that was protesting against academics and that somebody should do something about it. It was, it was wrong. It shouldn't have happened. They shouldn't have thrown this egg at us. So I thought, well, maybe I should do something about it. Which year was this? This was, what, which was this? Um, maybe um, 2005 or six. So it's about 2005 or six. That far back. Okay, continue, please. Sorry. Yes. Yes. So, so I started working on this book, and it was actually published in New York in 2009, and then um, by Penguin. And it was a book, it was called An Alternative History. The Hindu is an alternative history. And it was explicitly an alternative to the history that was being set forth and made public by the Indian government at that time. That Rama lived and he lived in Ayodhya and there and so forth and so forth. Um, and that the Muslims have always been horrible. It was just the whole political distortion. And it was also a distortion of what other people, not just the BJP people, thought. It was about the voices of Dalits and women that had been appreciated in ancient Indian texts, that it wasn't that they're always sexist and they were always casteist. That I picked out texts with sympathies for people we now call Dalits and very sympathetic descriptions of women and what they have to suffer from bad husbands and so forth. So in a way, it was attempted to um, show the good side, the morally, ethically strong side of Hindus, <clears throat> which Western people were criticizing, these people don't treat women well, they don't treat Dal Dalits well, and at the same time to set the historical record straight to free it from the distortions which were the basis of historical persecutions going on in India. So it was explicitly an alternative to what was being said. It was the Aryan invasion theory was not correct. It was also not correct that the Indus Valley was already a great religion and the source of Hinduism. The Indus Valley was not a great source of Hinduism. We don't know anything about the Indus Valley. So I was debunking a lot of myths, both liberal myths and right-wing political myths, and I was trying to give the alternative view of all of that. The, what I think is wrong with the books, not what other people thought, it, I brought it up to the present day. I, I was a history of the Hindus right till now, and I'm a Sanskritist. I really know a certain amount about the early texts, but I don't read Persian. I don't really know Mughal history very well, and I'm not an expert on the Raj. So the final chapters of the book are weak, and the serious reviews of the book say, well, it's, lots, it's a very good book, has nice things in it, but... These last chapters a week. So the real problem with the book is that it went on too far in history to periods in which 
I was not expert. I should have gotten other colleagues to help me out with that. But I'll stand by the beginning chapters. I think they really are valid and they're fair. And they are pro-Hindu. They're trying to show how how the Hindus in the Mahabharata, the story of Ekalavya, where he has to cut off his thumb. The author of the Mahabharata feels very bad about the fact that Ekalavya has to cut off his thumb. So it was my attempt really to show how good Hinduism was, how ethically and socially the traditions are strong and the present-day attempts to uh, denigrate women, uh, to denigrate Muslims, went against the historical uh, virtues of Hinduism. And then the book was just totally misread, totally misread. But and then came the fuss. But uh, we are talking of 2009. When did the criticism first begin by pro-Hindu when, groups? When it was published, it was published in New York in 2009. It was published in India in 2010. I I was at the Jaipur Literary Festival with Will Dalrymple in 2010, and I presented the book there. Um, and then I went back to America, and then all hell broke loose. So it was that was, that's when it began, as early as that. It was before Modi came to power. And the withdrawal of the book by Penguin, that happened much later, didn't it? Yes, yes. Right. The lawsuit went on for several years. So that that's how we put those two together. Yeah. So what happened was, again, complicated. The book was published by Penguin New York, then it was published by Penguin India. And at that time, Ravi Singh was the chief editor at Penguin India and the publisher. And he went over the book and we made some changes for the Indian edition to satisfy the Indian government. For one thing, we drew the boundaries of Kashmir differently, according to the rules for the publication of books in India. And we changed some of the language that we thought might have been offensive. In particular, we took out the word rape and called it assault or something. We, 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 we tried to be sensitive and it was published and all hell broke loose. And at the same time, Penguin was bought by Bertelsmann, a big German company. And the lawsuit was brought, and the powers that be up in Germany said, we don't want a lawsuit against one of our books. Drop the book. So the command came from on high, down from Germany to Penguin India. Penguin dropped the book. Ravi Singh left Penguin India, founded another company. I flew to England and spoke to Sir John Makinson, who was the head of Penguin all over the whole world, Penguin, and was married to Amartya Sen's daughter. Amartya Sen is an old friend of mine. So Makinson was a good guy. And um, we had lunch together in London, and he said, well, Penguin has promised never to publish the book in India. Therefore, the publication rights to the book are no good to us. Let me give you free the right to publish the book in India. And he did. And I gave it to Ravi Singh, who had now started a new company. And Ravi republished the book in India. And there was no new lawsuit. It continued to thrive in India. For a while, you got it wrapped in brown paper underneath the counter, the way we used to buy Henry Miller books when I was young. Sneaky, sneaky. It was kind of a thing that you had. And then it was just available and it's available to this day so it kind of just it, we lost the lawsuit that is we dropped the lawsuit there was never a, a, a no judge ever made a judgment on the penguin said let's just get out of this mess we don't want a lawsuit um but who won that i don't know who won that the book is still available did you try to engage in a dialogue with your critics i did in the beginning but it didn't last long. Um, many of them said that they hadn't read the book. I would say, what in the book do you find offensive? And they would say, I would never read your book. So there's the end of that conversation. Or they would say something like, why do you hate Hindus? And I would say, why do you think I hate Hindus? I don't hate Hindus. I've devoted my whole life to Hindus. They said, no, no, your book hates Hindus. There were one or two particular points in the lawsuit that I had said that Vivekananda had said, I eat meat. Well, Vivekananda did say, I eat meat. It's a matter of historical record. 
But the idea was, even though it was true, I shouldn't have said it because it made a lot of Hindus very sad to hear that Vivekananda ate meat. And against those arguments, I was helpless. If you could prove, as you could in the Mughal and British sections of it, that I was not exactly inaccurate, but that it was kind of stupid. Some of the things I said were not really very subtle. But that was not the point. It wasn't that it wasn't true. It was that it shouldn't have been said. And against that, I had no argument. At that point, I said, I can't talk to you. But that's uh, becoming more and more true of the world, isn't it? Because It is indeed. It is indeed. Yeah, There's it's... that law, the PL 235, whatever it is, <clears throat> which says it's against the rule, it's against the law to publish anything that might offend uh, religious sentiments. And that law was made by the British in the early 20th century to protect Muslims from Hindus. And that was the law that was brought forth later on to protect Hindus from people who published things that might in fact be true, but were offensive. And that's an argument I could do nothing about. I had not intended to offend, but I intended to say what I thought was the truth, and the truth was offensive. It was, uh, according to that law, I was guilty. We'll be right back after this short break. You're the people pleaser, right? Oh, yes. Or then desperately seeking the one? Oh wait, you're the one who doesn't think they're ever good enough. Oh. So much drama. And for what? Is it doing you any good? <laughs> Listen to me. I'm Chetna, your favorite positive action coach. Yes, I'm the one who has been dropping all those truth bombs on every episode. I know. And it's time you learn to say no to drama. That's also what my podcast is called. And a new episode is out every Monday and Wednesday on the IBM Podcast app, website, as well as all major podcasting platforms. Welcome back to the Wire Talks. This is, of course, your book is out. It's available. Uh, Ravi Singh made those changes. Would you write the book differently today? Only in the way that I've said, I would get more help with the Mughal and British, the, the historiography of the later period where I'm very weak. I would not change a single word of the early chapters about the Hindus based on the Sanskrit text, which I think I got right. And I think in a way, it's more right than it ever was. I mean, now, that was before the Babri Masjid. It was before these terrible things started happening. I think there's more need for a book that actually explains what the Ramayana really is and that there was no such person as Ram born in Ayodhya. Uh, there's more need for it now than there was then. This business of the canal in Sri Lanka and so forth that I've written about elsewhere. Um, so yes, I think there's more... I, the, the first part of the book, the part that people objected to, I would not change a word of. I would try to be a little little more subtle in my discussion of the Mughal and British periods. Those are, those are the changes I would make. And uh, did I get the sense that you have not been able to travel to India since then? You have, indeed, um, for several reasons. First of all, I'm old now, and I have problems with my legs. I've broken all my knees and all my hips and all my ankles and so forth. So uh, I'm, I'm not a great traveler, but that's, but that's not, that, but in times that's recent. Um, um, because Penguin dropped the lawsuit, it never came to court. I was served with a summons and I did not appear in court. Um, that put me in contempt of court. Had there been a lawsuit, had we gone to court and won or lost, the judge would have taken me out of contempt at the end of the lawsuit. It never happened. And so I've consulted several Indian lawyers, and I know, and some say yes and some say no, but there's certainly a question about if I appeared. There's certainly a question. If I appeared at the Delhi airport and I gave the man my passport, he would look at it and he would say, would you step this way, please, madam? And I would then phone the American consul and uh, we, would, we would have a go around. So first of all, legally, I'm not sure of my status. But beyond that, 
I know that there are a lot of very angry people in India who really don't like me. And I also know that I'm not as safe there as I am here in America. And it's just possible that somebody would hurt me. Um, they hurt all sorts of people they don't like. They ran, you know, they destroyed publishers' offices and so forth. Uh, I don't feel that there is protection for people in India with alternative views. And there is also not protection for Muslims. I have many Muslim friends in India. And so I would not feel, I may be wrong, but I would not feel physically safe in India. And I might not even be legally able to go there. So those two reasons, plus the fact that if I go to an airport, I have to have a wheelchair and all that awful business that I hate. I just stay here in America and write books. But you don't get any kind of hate mail, threats, or anything while you're in America. I, I sometimes get, I, I have two files. I have Hindu hate mail, Hindu fan mail. And I get several letters of each type each week. I get people who say, why, why do you hate Hindus? And I get people who said, I've just read one of your books. It's a wonderful book. Thank you for writing that book. And then I get another person who says, why do you hate Hindus? <clears throat> so I put them, I answer the ones that say, thank you for your book. And I don't answer the ones that say, why do you hate Hindus? I have a collection of them. I might do something with it, but I, I don't take it seriously. If someone says to me, I hate you because you talk too much. I think, well, you know, I talk too much. It's true. That's a flaw. And somebody could dislike me for that. I feel bad about that. I think they're right. I should be, I should listen better. I should be a better listener. But if someone says, I hate you because you have green hair, that does not hurt me at all. And to say, I hate you because you hate Hindus is to say, I hate you because you have green hair. It doesn't affect me. Uh, it's so obviously not true that it just, it's nonsense. It's just nonsense to me. When someone says you've made a mistake in your book, I hate that because I don't like being criticized. But if it's right, it's right. So no, the, the hate mail, which is very often anti-Semitic, I wish Hitler had killed all of the Jews. That's what he should have done. It's sometimes pornographic. Did your father rape you? Is that why you keep writing about sex? I say, well, this is a sick and unhappy person who wrote this, and I put it in the Hindu hate mail file. But you do know that uh, academics in the United States who are now getting together uh, because they find that there are aggressive campaigns against uh, a few academics from yes. local American Hindu groups. I, I support those groups, the, the Hindus for Human Rights group which is against the Hindu faction in America. In America, I can do something about it. I also worry very much about my students, not only because they are my students, and therefore their people either want to hire one of my students or they don't want to hire one of my students, but my students have all gotten good jobs. So I leave you, I leave you with that one, one, one fact. Uh, but I'm just about to finish the dissertation of my very last student because I've retired now my 83rd student. So I worry about my students of India getting visas to India, being able to do research in India, being published in India. And so in a way, it makes me feel all the more necessary for me to speak out because I feel they can't get me in a way. I'm no longer, they can't fire me because I'm retired. Um, I live here. I feel safe in, in that sense that I can, I can say, what I really think, and my students can't. They live in a world in which they won't get jobs. The Hindu Hindutva people will oppose them in America. They won't get visas to India. I really worry about my students' inability to say what they really think. They take other topics. They avoid the subject. They leave things apart. They, they, do, and they do other projects. They avoid the sensitive areas because they want to go on living in a world in which they want to be in India, to have the experience that I had when I was when I was 22 years old. So I feel that I'm because I am old and because I am retired, it wouldn't even matter if somebody killed me. I mean, I'm, I'm old. I'm at the end of my life. So it gives me a kind of courage. Um, but I really worry about my young students. And uh, I feel so sorry that America, too, is... Um, 
in the grip of all sorts of religious fanatics, not only Hindu fanatics, but fanatics of all kinds. Anti-Semitism is growing again in America. Racism, you know about that. So the world has become a very dangerous place in general for people with liberal views. But I feel, I wouldn't say safe, anyone can kill me anytime, but I mean, I feel it doesn't matter so much if something happens to me because I'm at the end of a long career and that since I don't need to be hired or I don't need to get a visa to India, I have privileges that I, it's my moral duty to exercise. Not being able to come to India for so many years, uh, all the ambiguities that are there, does it make you feel sad? Of course it does. It makes me feel so sad. First of all, I have friends in India. Uh, Most of my friends I can see here, but I had one particular friend, Sanjay Aya, who was ill and who couldn't fly anymore. And I very much wanted to see him. And he died before I could see him because he couldn't come here. So I, there are people, there are still people who are alive in India that I would like to visit, um, older people who don't fly around. So yes, I would like, I'd like to, to be with my friends in India. And in addition, uh, there are, I did travel a lot in India, but the places I never, I never got up to Darjeeling and never got to Kashmir. I never really got to the hill stations, to Uti and places like that. I always wanted to visit them and I never did. In addition, my student, David Shulman, has been writing wonderful books about the Kudiyatam performances in South India. And I would love to see some of those performances of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. I just love to go back to India. I'd love to go back to Kerala. Um, it's just, I'd love to go back to, to Jaipur and to see the Marwari horses. I wrote a book about horses a couple of years ago. And I ended up writing quite a lot about the Marwari horses, which are the ones that have the ears that go like that and they curve in like that. Well, you can't see now. Anyway, but they have ears that curve in. And I um, I hadn't really met any Marwari horses when I was in India. So I'd like to go down and see some of those Marwari horses. There are a lot of things. I just like to smell India again, that particular Indian smell, which I love. Um, I'd like to see the Ganges again. I'd like to go back to Benares again. So I miss India, um, but I feel very lucky that I saw it for a long time and when I was very young and when it was a different place from what it is now, a wonderful place, a much more innocent place, and that I made other trips to the Jaipur Literary Festival. And um, I feel privileged to have seen India as much as I had and that it would be greedy to say, I want to go on, I want to go on, I want to go on. So. I don't I don't regret it as much as I would have if it had happened when I was younger. But uh, on this note, I mean, you can't visit here for so many reasons, but any more books on India coming up? There's one coming up right away, actually, um, in, I think, August or September. Um, I translated the last books of the Mahabharata. It's called After the War, the last books of the Mahabharata. And um, I found it was important for our time because it's after the war and the warriors are mourning the fact that they murdered their friends. It was a it was a fraternal war. And it's really about peace, what we now call peace and reconciliation. It's about how to go on living in a world with people who killed your sons and you killed their sons. How to... When Yudhishthira goes to heaven, he finds his enemy Duryodhana there. He says, I don't want to be here with him. He has to learn how to live with his enemy. It's a beautiful part of the Mahabharata. It's never really been well translated, and I've annotated it as well. So that's a book that I care about very much. It's, it's a work of translation. It's a, uh, it's a translation of, of the Mahabharata. Mahabharata is the best book there is. So I had a lot of fun doing it. I love doing it. But I think it's also relevant in some ways. And uh, Ravi Singh and Speaking Tiger are bringing that out in a couple of months. Meanwhile, I'm working in a kind of a way about a translation of the stories in the Mahabharata that have nothing to do with anything, that are not about the central character. They're sprinkled all through the last books. 12, 13, 14, the Shanti Parwan, the Anushasana, the, and they're about 
65 of those stories. Some of them are like Aesop's fables. Some of them are very dharmic stories about um, what to do in, in a, when there's a moral crisis. And I I want to put them all together, and I don't, it's a fishing trip. I don't know what they will prove. I don't know what what I will find out that those stories have in common, the points that they make, but they're great stories. And also, I just like translating Sanskrit. So other people do crossword puzzles, and I translate Sanskrit. So I swear, every day I do a little bit of that, and I may publish that someday. But the one that's coming out right now that I really care about is finished. And uh, it's called After the War. I'll be curious to see what, what people think of that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Doniger. That, uh, on that note, uh, it's wonderful to see that a retired professor of an academic who knows so much about India has visited India since the 1960s and continues to not only talk about her experiences, but bring out books with amazing regularity. You've got books on horses, you've got books on your letters from the 60s, and now a book on the Mahabharat stories that, uh, as you said, don't add up to anything. We look forward to the next book. And I do hope, for our sake, as much as yours, that you get a chance to visit India. Meanwhile, I hope your file stops growing. Uh, the hate <laughs> file stops growing. So that was Professor Wendy Doniger, who is well known. I may add here with caveats, a bit notorious, but <laughs> her book actually, which I have read halfway, I must confess, on uh, the Hindus is really speaking a book that shows Hindus as tolerant people. So I don't know why there was all this uh, agitation against it. And her latest book is An American Girl in uh, India about her experiences as a young researcher in the 1960s, early 1960s. Thank you once again for joining us. I'm sure you, there is much more to say. This can go on and on. Oh, yes. And uh, we'll be back again next week with another guest. Till then, from me, Siddharth Bhatia, and the rest of the Wire Talks team, goodbye. You can check out this podcast and other interesting ones on the Wire website, the IVM podcast website, app, or wherever else that you get your podcasts. Goodbye from me, Siddharth Bhatia, and the Wire Talks podcast team. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Hello, hello. It's been another great week here on the IVM Podcasts Network. On The Habit Coach, fitness expert Devrat Vijay, better known as Ninja Dev, tells Ashton about how we can approach fitness the right way. It's all things MMA on the Filter Coffee podcast. Karthik talks to Somesh Kamra, co-host of our Fight Mania podcast. On Raw and Organic, founder of Superkicks, Sangeet Paryani shares his journey with Kunal. Ikaduka Economy is back after a break. Host Abhinav Trivedi and CEO of Helicon Consulting Vikram Limse discuss what SME entrepreneurs can learn from the Sri Lankan crisis. And on the Life Manifesto, Zarina teaches us the art of negotiation. We've got some exciting news for you. IVM Podcasts has just launched its merch and our first line is out now. Head to the IVM Podcasts website and click on the shop tab to check out our first collection of t-shirts. Do follow us on social media via IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any platforms you're listening on. And you can also check us out on YouTube. We're also doing a small listener survey to better understand how you respond to our shows and advertising on the network. We would really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes to fill it in. It helps us build better shows for you. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week. SBI Life Insurance. Apne liye, apno ke liye. Jupiter, a digital banking app. Cap Gemini, get the future you want. Intel V Pro, built for business. And Intel, future banao wonderful with Intel powered laptops.